Thank you, Deirdre. I want to thank Anna for nearly bringing me to tears on the issue of climate change. It's become such a data-driven conversation that we have forgotten the importance and power of grief in thinking about this. When you think about the huge gap right now between the 98% of climate scientists who've come to consensus on this being anthropogenic and an urgent crisis, and the 51% of Americans and 45% of legislatures who agree, I think that gap comes from a failure of hoping the next study, right, or the next datum will tip us and convince us and compel us to action. What we're leaving out are things like grief and the capacity of the arts to spark that. And with Robin Kimmerer, she brings us to a concept and to an emotional experience very related to grief, and that is gratitude. When uh, I'm the dean of the School of Environment and Sustainability at Western, just over the mountains, uh, my kids and I are here, uh, are here, and my little seven-year-old just hiked from Gunnison to Peonia last week with me. It's not that far away. Um, and uh, talk about grieving. We went a whole day looking for water, that little body, right, trying to find water. And I was thinking to myself, man, I might get charged by social services for neglect in the age of climate change, right? Um, but Robin Kimmerer came to our campus last fall and, and challenged us to think about the powers and limitations of gratitude. And in so doing, she kind of recognized that sort of the question the gentleman over here was asking about when you have such global industrial consumption and systems, you know, to what extent does an individual action truly make a difference. And so what Robin said was, you know, in this era of the sixth great extinction, in this era in which perhaps a third of species could be gone by end of century, in this era of displacement of the Inuit doing, due to melting ice, right, where climate change is truly 21st century Indian removal, gratitude, she said, quote, gratitude must seem like weak tea, right? But she challenged us to think about gratitude on a deeper, on a deeper scale and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a more significant revolutionary way. And what she argued was that in learning how to express gratitude, say a, a simple practice like picking berries, to choose not to take the first berry, she argued, is an expression of gratitude to that food system that will likely lead you to show restraint with the last berry. That the very act of gratitude um, leads to the act of restraint, but on an even more important scale, that act of gratitude requires you to recognize the world as more than what she called just stuff. And what Robin Wall Kimmerer argued to us was that to the extent that we continue to see the world as just stuff, we will not have moral obligation to the more than human world. All right? And so, what are the practices and processes that will inspire us to see the world is having equal intrinsic value to us, uh, to seeing ourselves as sharing a home uh, with the world that shares autonomy in that home with us. She thinks it starts with gratitude because you can't express gratitude in her view to something that you're just calling a thing. Right? You've objectified it by seeing a thing. And she challenged us, and she's Potawatomi, and she challenged us to think about in the Anishinaabe language how you know, they don't call the moon it, call it her, they don't call a mountain it, right, in that they don't want to view the world as things, as almost like verbs, like looking at a tree, it, it, it's treeing, it's not a tree, it's not it, it's a relation. So she has us thinking about gratitude as coming from a sense of uh, the more than human beings as kin, with which we have deep relations of shared intrinsic value and with whom we can connect through the act of gratitude. And so I think she really challenged the Gunnison audience to see the revolutionary potential of gratitude. And in Anna's talk, um, in talking about the 198 forms of um, nonviolence, I started to wonder, you know, is grief in that list? Or is, or is that 199? Is gratitude in that list? Or is that 200? Um, and so how do we start thinking about the revolutionary potential of gratitude to completely undercut the way in which we've objectified the world and to 
challenge us in the deepest of ways to um, learn from indigenous practices of reciprocity. And is Robin ready? And so um, with that, please join me in expressing gratitude for gratitude and, and welcoming uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer. Hi, Robin. How are you doing? And again, I want to give special gratitude to the organizers of this remarkable gathering, this symbiosis of art and science this meeting of matter and spirit, of land and culture. And so I congratulate you for your symbiotic and holistic vision of doing this work together to celebrate our relationship with the earth. And when we think about the world as a remarkable gifts that are given to us, the question then arises is what is our response to those gifts? What is it that we are called to do? And one of the things is that gift language. John very kindly talked about this notion of how words matter, language matters. We could look at all of this, as my, my science colleagues do, as natural resources, as if it was just material waiting for us to transform it into something useful, or we could think of them as gifts. Gifts from all of these beings um, who sustain, sustain our lives. And when we think about the world as gift, that changes everything, because it then brings us to this question of what does the earth ask of us? Because every one of us this morning remembers that we are perhaps against our will, sometimes with complicity, living in a world harnessed to institutions that keep asking us what more can we take from the earth? as opposed to what does the earth ask of us. And this unbridled exploitation, this relentless taking, is I think the very thing that has brought us to this age of the sixth extinction, to the cusp of climate chaos. And so this question of what does the earth ask of us couldn't be important. But in order to answer that question together this morning, or at least to spark our thinking about it, to answer the question of what does the earth or the land ask of us, well, what does land mean? And that, of course, depends on our worldview. And in the Western worldview, in which many of us are situated, one of the primary meanings of land is land as capital, right? Um, land as natural resources, again, lacking inherent value, um, but ready to be transformed into commodities. Land, very importantly, as property. To think about land as property, land as that for which we can claim rights, is a um, is a powerful, potent uh, concept that we need to think about very carefully. We also, in the Western world, you acknowledge land as our sustainer. That we think about the land as a source of ecosystem services. What I like to think about as as gifts, a uh, way that the land sustains us. But if we shift our day, if we think about what does land mean from the indigenous worldview, and I've generalized them across 600 cultures that are inhabit North America, Turtle Island, um, but we hold in common this notion of land as identity, land as the thing that really helps us understand who we are, where people are inseparable from identity, land certainly as our sustainer, the ones who care for us, who feed us, who bring us a cool drink of water. Land as the residence not only of human people, but of our non-human, or I really like to say, more than human relatives, because fortunately we don't live here alone. Land as our connection to our ancestors and to our teachings, to our original instructions, which are present in the very ground that we walk upon. In the indigenous world, we also think about land essentially as a library, land as a source of knowledge to whom we search, turn for creative solutions. Land not only as library, but as our pharmacy, land as healer, land as in spirit, full of spirit in a way that the Western worldview doesn't comprehend in land. Certainly, land as our home, with all of those meanings. 
Land not as property, land not as a place for which we have rights, but as the place where we have our moral responsibility. That's really what we need in land, land as land. And all of these meanings of land bring us to some very important questions that I know is considering in your symposium. Is land simply a source of belongings? Or is it what we want to explore this morning under the umbrella of what does the earth ask of us? And this slide is to explain me that when we think about sustainability, which that very broad, slippery concept that has brought us all together this morning, we know that continued sustainability is threatened. And I want to interrogate just a little bit about what sustainability means. And I want to do that with a story from a, a Algonquin biologist, Carol Crow, who shared this experience with me. Of, she wanted to book a sustainability conference for her nation. And so she asked for a couple of grants her band council in Canada. And her elder said, well, what is sustainability? And she remembers being kind of surprised by that. Well, that's the way our people have well in place for millennia. But she used these definitions that I've put up on these slides, definitions that are familiar for all of you. And she shared these with her elders. Highlighted in yellow are some of the commonalities. This notion that the land can live in such a way that the land will continue to provide for us, that it will ensure future generations of living the same things that we have today. And so she gave these definitions to her elders, and she says that they were very quiet. And uh, she thought we're probably going to turn down her roots because they seem so grave and serious. And then they said, no. We want you to go. We want you to go to this conference on sustainability, and we want you to carry a message. And that message is that that sounds to me like they're just trying to find a way to keep on taking. It's not our right to keep on taking. They told her that when our feet hit the ground in the morning, the first thing we should be thinking is what can we give? What can we give back in return for all the gifts of the earth? And this reframing of sustainability in not how can we keep on taking without abridging our common future, but what is it that we have to, to give as people is a profound shift in thinking about our role, away from thinking about humans as consumers to thinking about and reclaiming our traditional roles as givers, as givers to the in fact, what the earth asks of us and calls to us is to call us to reciprocity, to give back our gifts in return for all that the earth gives us. And as John Kind mentioned in his, his introduction, one of the first teachings and our original instructions that we carry is that the first thing that we give back to the earth is, is, is gratitude. And this is a very Often it is not the weak tea of just light thank yous, because in the time of climate chaos, in the time of the sixth extinction, we don't need weak tea. We need strong medicine. We need a strong medicine of radical gratitude. And giving thanks implies recognition of that gift. When you give thanks to that apple tree, who is giving you that apple, whose offspring is is in your hand, about to be in your body. That's a profound kind of relationship of, of gratitude. And it is, um, there is an evolutionary advantage, actually, to the practice of gratitude, because it, gratitude in its very nature does lead to self change, as John mentioned, which has sustainable consequences. And taking only what you need to appreciate the gifts that are around you, to treat them so differently than if they are natural resources, as if there was a, simply a shopping bag or a, a warehouse of commodities out there, rather than gifts from our more than human relatives. Practicing gratitude is a radical in a consumption-driven society. And as you may know, our indigenous storytelling tradition 
He is writ with cautionary tales about what happens when we forget gratitude, the self-restraint that's associated with it. Those stories are, there are hundreds of them, but basically what I think that boils down to is that when people forget to honor the gift, the consequences are always material as well as spiritual. When people don't engage in gratitude, the spring of the, the corn doesn't come back, the animals don't return. And if we think about it, then the Western storytelling tradition is pretty silent on this notion of gratitude and, and reciprocity. And that leads us to this time when we're afraid of the very atmosphere that we have created. You don't have to invent these discourses. You have to remember, because we human people have protocols for gratitude. We apply them formally to one another. We say thank you. We know that receiving a gift opens that door to reciprocity. Um, but gratitude, remember, is not our only gift, because we have gifts of storytelling, music, art, so raising gardens and, and raising a ruckus. We have our own gifts to give. And the next step, I think, in our cultural evolution towards sustainability, if we are to persist here as a species on this beautiful planet, is to expand a protocol of gratitude to the living earth, to remind us to always be giving back so that the earth herself can be that we live in such a way that the earth can be grateful for our presence. That is a powerful matter. When we ask this question, what does the earth ask of us? What else does the earth ask of us? I think attention. Attention. Isn't it interesting that when we use that word, we often say paying attention? Because paying attention does come at a cost of focus and, and energy. And each one of us is in happen with that particular gift of tension. And in a world that gives us maple syrup, magical pines, and salamanders, should we be at least paying attention? Paying attention, I think, is an ongoing act of, of reciprocity. Because attention, as we know, generates wonder, which generates more attention, which generates joy. And paying attention to the more that the world doesn't lead only to amazement. It leads to an acknowledgement of pain. Because when we pay attention, we see equally and feel equally the beauty and the wounds. We see the old growth and we feel the clear cut. We feel the mountain and we feel the plain. Paying attention sharpens our ability to more suffering, to respond, and to be responsible. And this too is a gift, because when we fall in love with people, we can't be bystanders for destruction. Attention because intention coalesces itself to act on behalf of life. One of the powerful ways that we have paying attention as human beings is with names. Names, I think. Know the names of our human neighbors and of our more than human neighbors is a profound act of respect and relationship and paying attention. It's a sign of respect and connection to for the name of those who are around you. And I feel like it's a sign of disrespect not to invest that energy in, in knowing names. Not just, of course, because I'm a plant science professor, botany professor, I always ask my students to know a name, but for a deeper reason than that. Because names are the way we put energy into the attention that we have. For example, did you know that the average American culture can recognize, has paid attention to, a hundred different corporate logos? And I know I can barely see your faces in the dark, but you, you, you're recognizing them yourself. Say, yeah, I can recognize those. Of course you can, because we humans have this gift of classification and a kind of taxonomy of the world. 
and advertising and corporate culture has hijacked our sense of paying attention and naming. Because while we can recognize a hundred different corporate logos, on average we recognize only ten clouds. The ones who really sustain us. And in fact, when we inquire about that list of what ten plants do people recognize, one of them, almost whatever they came from, is a Christmas tree. <laughs> so I think that means we really only have not. nine. Nine on that So is it a surprise then, given this this dichotomy and where we have paid our attention, that we have accepted a political system that grants legal personhood to corporations? and no status at all for salamanders and redwoods. Learning the names of the plants and the animals is a powerful act of reciprocity, a powerful act of support on their behalf. It opens the door to neighborly, to reciprocity. How can we reciprocate the gifts of the earth if we don't even know who they are? What does the earth ask of us? On our list of things to think about to remember this morning, I think we are also called to healing, to restoration, to cleaning up after ourselves. The earth calls us to restoration. And much of my work as a plant ecologist has been devoted to restoration. Let me show you just a map of one of those places as a as a, as a placeholder. This is Onondaga Lake. This is the lake in my uh, homeland, and it is named Onondaga Lake because it is the sacred lake of the Onondaga people, who are the central fire of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. It is here that the peacemaker walk on his shore. It is here that the great law of peace was delivered. But today, the indigenous conception and reality of Onondaga has been buried under that rest worldview that thinks about none as sorts of property capital. The place where the peacemaker walked is buried 30 feet under industrial sludge. When we think about restoring, healing the damage that we've done, I think about Onondaga Lake, you may call to mind the places of your own. But the same gifts that we carry of people that have allowed us to do this kind of bearing of one way of being under another also hold the key to restoration. And ecosystem restoration, cleaning up the messes that we've made, is a powerful form of reciprocity that we humans possess and that we are called to give. Our strong minds, our strong hands, our tools of science and engineering can be used in this capacity. But in my work in doing exploration in Onondaga Lake ecosystems and elsewhere, what I really came to understand is that it's not the land of earth. It's our relationship to land that's earth. Filling a sacred lake full of toxic mercury is a sign of a broken relationship. And so if we are to engage in reciprocity with the land, we have to heal our relationship to land, not just the land ourselves. And I always like to invoke at this time Harry Navham, my friend and colleague, maybe yours as well, who, when writing about restoration, reminds us that what we need is not just restoration but restoration, and to create an opportunity for us to remember and perhaps be creating a different story about our relationship to him, a way that reminds us about land as whole, land as identity. Land is the place where we enact our moral responsibility. And we know that all over Turtle Island today, led in many cases by indigenous nations, by allies, by grassroots organizations, all over the country, this restoration is a foot. And the work that you're doing in Paonia of bringing together art and science is a powerful act of restoration. We have to remember that our this notion of ourselves as only exploiters that takes us from the land is a relatively recent notion. I would say it's about 500 years old. We have to remember and go back to our original instructions to ask ourselves about the story of ourselves as givers, as members of a reciprocal community, always asking what 
can we get? What does the earth ask of us? On our list, let's add this ocean of respect. Respect for the non people the more than human beings who live around us. To remember that these are human beings, while they are not human beings, are beings, are full persons, with their own intentions, their own contributions to the world, and indeed their own rights to live. And both science and spirituality have demonstrated over and over again the fundamentals of our relatedness to our more than human kinfolk. We are far more the same than we are different. We are all governed by the same ecological and evolutionary rules. And one of those rules is respect and reciprocity. And I'd ask us to consider this morning how different the world would be if we extended the same respect and passion, agency, as we'll talk about in a few moments, legal rights to other species as we do for two human people. And reserving personhood, single species, i.e. our own, in a language and in ways of living perpetuates this fallacy of human exceptionalism of ourselves as, as different, more deserving the riches of the earth than all of our other more than human kinfolk. Recognition of personhood of other beings asks that we relinquish our perceived role as masters of the universe in some way and celebrate instead our belonging, our belonging as an equal member in the democracy of a species. And one of the ways that we can do that, and again, as John uh, mentioned, is paying respect through language. And I want to take a few moments to talk about this, because the way that we speak, informing the way that we behave, that we live, that we create relationships with the living world, is within our power. I sometimes despair of our of my individual capacities to be able to halt development of a uranium mine or single-handedly reclaim on a dog lake, but I am responsible for my own speech for the way that I bring language to the world. So let's talk a little bit about the forever of empathy, because it might be that the pathway to the reciprocal relationship is paved with the ground. And you know, in the English language, if you look at this beautiful picture of the monarch and the golden eye and the aster, which are about to come out here in the summer, um, you look at them and say, well, where are the people in that beautiful photograph? And of course, in the, in the, if we spoke English and live in the Western world, we would say there are no people there. But in the indigenous worldview, we see that golden rod, that butterfly, that men they lay as, as, as people. And in the English language, that butterfly, we have no way to refer to that butterfly except as it. I see it. It's pollinating. I see it, that, that open reference. Um, it in the world is a powerful and potent and I think ultimate and violent way of interacting with the world. Because if you think about it, in English, because we have no way to speak of the living text, is we are objectifying nature at, at every turn. And I'd ask you to do just a little thought experiment and think about your loving grandmother, maybe standing in the kitchen making soup. And if someone came in and said, oh look, it's wearing an apron, we would be at first maybe laughing a little oh, at a radical error, but that's a, we were we disrespected our grandmother by calling her it. We made her different. The spoon that she's holding in her hand, she's an object. It's a profound act of disrespect because it is another robs one of self kingship, reduces a person to a mere thing. But isn't that how we treat our beloved grandmother? We call her it, we treat her as if she was the thing, but natural resource. In the Potawatomi language, however, 
that bloodlust, that golden, that asters, the trees, the salamanders, the redwoods, rocks, the water, the mountains, all of them we refer to in the grammar of Atsi. We speak of them with the same grammar, I think they will work our family because they are our family. And I have been with Mike in your creative community of artists and scientists on behalf of the living land, engage in a little experiment with me, a modest proposal to reclaim a grammar of animacy with new pronoun. Could we figure out a way to animate English so that we could all say it about the needs and in fact address the us as our relative? I really find it deeply ironic that Eve always hated grammar in <laughs> high school English, as he probably did too, are now advocating um, for conservation strategies based on, uh, on the grammar. But uh, I think that the pronouns of coalition. So, what might they be? I've been working with my language teacher on this, my Padawan language teacher, who sadly just passed away. Um, I asked him, what is our word for a living being of the earth, not a thing, but being? And he gave me this beautiful word, the modesty, a Beautiful word. I don't think it's going to slide into English diesel people. Um, so what about a the end of that word, which means the earth? Or at the end of that word, the key, an earth being? Could we imagine, instead of saying it about the world, or he, or she. But we have he, she, she, and it. Let's give yourself another choice. The choice of he, to say it those beautiful maples. Not, I'm going to go tap it for a natural resource, but he is giving us a gift this spring of a sweet sound. Speaking of our relatives as earth beings and not as things. And of course we're going to need the a plural form for that as well. And here, you don't have to turn to the Anishinaabe language to borrow that term, to be inspired by it. Although, interestingly, the way we pluralize words in some words in Potawatomi um, actually uh, brings us to this next word, which is from English. What if we pluralize that key to make it the word tin? So that we say of our, every time we speak of the natural world, not as it, as natural resources, as commodities or ecosystem services, but as our relatives, as our beloved relatives. For those geese start to fly south as they will soon, if they are in our, our leaving us now, come back soon, have a safe trip. I've done this linguistic experiment with my students to ask them to try on using he and kin to set aside it as we set aside those words we don't need any longer. I don't think we need a world view that objectifies the world that thinks of all of our relatives simply as natural resources. And when our students have played with these words in their own languages, their dominant response to their use is, yeah, it's a little hard. It's a little hard at first, but it makes me so happy. Now here's a question. If we regard the living world, world and is known in many cases as the honorable harvest, and it is this way of paying respect to the living world that I want to share with you today. Not because you don't all be know. I suspect that you know all of this already, but I always remind us that as human people, we forget and our job is to remember, to remember. And so the Honorable Harvest reminds us that whether we are talking about picking berries, netting fish, cutting firewood, or looking for energy sources, we should never take the first that way. We never take the first. We pass it by. And this inherent ethic of self-restraint is a way of showing that enough when we don't take the first one, we'll never take the last. 
When we have encountered the second, the third, the fourth, we then ask permission for that purpose. We don't simply take, we in it, take what we want. We regard that one as speaking and as permission we might have, because we know in our own language, in English, that if we take without permission, it's known as stealing. We then listen for the answer. Can we take? Science is a way of listening to that answer. Is there sufficient for us to take? Could it just be renewable? Art is a way to listen for that answer. Spirituality is a way to listen for that answer. And if the answer is yes, we take only what we need. And we use everything that we take. We don't waste it, remembering that it's a life that has been given. We practice gratitude. We take in such a way that minimizes harm. And just as those plants, the earth is shared with us, with us we share what has been given to us uh, in remembrance that it is not our property, it is a gift that we share with others. And then the honorable harvest always closes with this notion that in response to what we have been given, we have to reciprocate our gift. And we have to think carefully of what that might be. What do we give back to a river in return for the gift of a drink? What do we give back to Barry in, in turn for the gift of their fruit? That means we have to know them, means we have to honor them, and we have to know our own gifts in return in order that we can give them what they need. Also within the honorable harvest, is this teaching to take only that which is given to us. And it is this one that I find um, so full of promise as well as jump. Is how do we know what is given to us? But our elders tell us that this is a question we must wrestle with. I think sometimes that very are given to us um, by the plants themselves, but I'm pretty, and in fact our very notion of earth in the Holy Vishoni framing, earth is actually named in a, as a source of all these very gifts, very metaphorically speaking. And we say that the earth comes both one more and one more, and that we need to be mindful of keeping that bowl full. It is our gifts of a prophet that keep that bowl full. We are also reminded that there is only one bowl of finite proportion and that there's only one spoon, and that the gifts of Mother Earth are to be shared equally. There's not one big spoon for some people, and we will find it for others. And when we think of this, his gifts, and taking only that which is given to us, I feel pretty sure that coal from mountaintop removal is not given to us, that tar sands oil that destroys land is not given to us, that shale gas from hydrocrack that poisons water so we can have more things to throw away is clearly not given to us. But the sun's energy comes to us every day, is given to us as a gift. Every day the wind blows, the surf falls without impediment. These are given to us, really, limitless in supply, although not without their own cost, as we have to acknowledge. Take only that which is given is a key part of a sustainable energy policy. And had we collectively remembered from our ancestors the honorable purpose, had we taken only that which is given to us, perhaps today we would not again be afraid of our own atmosphere. This notion of the gift, not natural, Resources. The gift, and always returning the gift, is also felt in our Padawak language. I love to remember that our word mean, very, is the same root word as I see, as, as uh, to give. And in fact, ceremonies in the walk ask us to be like the bear. I'm being asked to um, finish up here, and I'm happy to do that. Um, let me perhaps maybe just stop right here. With this reminder, this invitation to this ceremony that we call the Bina de Wak, 
which means they give from the heart. And we are asked to reciprocate our gifts as human people, just as the berries give to us. And the teachings we are given in our original instruction is that gifts and responsibilities are two sides of the same coin. When the birds were given the gift of song, they were also given the gift to sing off the sun in the morning and to lighten our hearts. When the stars were given the gift of sparkle in the night sky, they were also given a responsibility to show us our pathway at night. And so when we gather together to talk about our responsibilities to the earth, another way to frame that is to ask ourselves, not what are our responsibilities, but what are our gifts? What are the gifts that each of us can bring to the world? We are teachers, we are gardeners, we are artists, we are storytellers, we are inventors, and the work that we do together to turn these gifts, to give them to the earth, allows us to think about ourselves again, not as consumers, but as givers. Whatever our gift, we are called to give it and dance for the renewal of the world. Miigwech, mi you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, who needs this microphone when we get to the Q&A portion, feel free to use this mic. But I'm going to pass this wireless one on to the two of you. And um, this is pretty free form. What I was hoping would, was that this would be an opportunity for you to just dialogue a little bit about your intersecting work. Okay. Miigwech. Thank you for being here. Um, one of the things that as Native people were taught, um, when you have the honor to learn another's language, and usually one of the first things you want to do is learn how to say thank you. And so I, I say it again, language. Thank you. Thank you. Can't you hear? Okay. Yes, and I can hear you much better. Thank you. PowerPoint so I can see you? Yes. Terrific. Great. I'll see if I can. So again, I, um, I'll just repeat what I said but at the point that you couldn't hear. Um, in, as being Indigenous people, when we travel the lands, we, we find it an honor to learn one another's language. And I have traveled from, from coast to coast. And one of the things that I've learned to say is thank you in your language, English. Thank you for, for sharing. Um, so one of the things that I found very interesting, and, um, and just the other day as well, I learned that uh, the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition, the, the five tribes that are working on um, that whole issue there, um, is looking upon your work as being very, very helpful and all of that. And so I was rather delighted to see your name pop up on several um, areas of where they're looking to intersect what you're doing, which is basically something that we had stood on from day one, is having the capacity to take science and indigenous knowledge and braid them together. 
not necessarily create that division between one or the other or hold one above the other, but rather to braid them as one so that um, people can gain that knowledge that we're not about trying to create a division, but rather we're trying to coexist um, and, and elevate the relationship between the, the, the beings that may be in different cultures. There's, um, there's the, the deities. There's, you know, how we, we address the, the different states of, of life, whether that's the plant life, whether that's our prayers. Everything has a sense of being, has a spirit. And, and I really appreciate uh, going through your book and seeing that relationship and then hearing how you illustrated it in your book was basically the same way that many of the tribal leaders that we had conveyed it to elected leaders to try to, to communicate that that thought. So I just wanted to share a little bit of what your work was exactly what we were saying and I was really, really honored to have received your book as a gift from a close friend of mine and uh, truly found a lot of merit and a lot of um, intersections of what you're doing exactly what I had always conveyed to people. Thank you. May I also say, Regina, how Am I on? No? Okay, sorry. <laughs> it's hard to know. I want to honor you as well for your amazing contributions and your work with Bears Ears. I have followed it closely and I so honor the work that you're doing. We are really aligned in, in our thinking and the, the ways in which traditional knowledge and scientific knowledge will be in, in a symbiotic relationship. Indigenous science and Western science for land care and the vision that you have articulated for that, for the land, and for the people, I honor and see me which to you too. Thank you. Thank you, Regina and Robin. And I just want to echo what Robin just said. It's such an honor to share a statement with you. Thank you for your work. Um, so in my work, uh, as a historian, ethicist, an ethicist of the environment, I try to understand um, more humble and thoughtful uh, ways in which um, the traditional environmental movement can engage with uh, Native American movements. Uh, my first book was called Catlin's Lament, about a figure from the 1830s named George Catlin who gave up the practice of law in order to travel west and live with and try to understand the intricacies of the diverse tribes of the American West and advocate through his art, through his writing, uh, to the best of his ability for those communities. And the mistake he made was that he assumed, he bought into the, the, the myth of the vanishing, quote unquote vanishing Indian, and ended up sort of two turning movements into memorials where, um, when the Lakota asked him not to visit the Red White Stone, the Red Pipestone Quarry, he ignored their advice and went and painted it. And now that rock is called Catlinite, named after him, right? And for him, it was because he viewed these, he had lived with the Mandan when many of them died of smallpox, and he felt like this was the fate of so many tribes. And because he felt that was a reality, he thought the best thing he could do was quote unquote, preserve on canvas their livelihoods as if that could be captured through an image, which in turn objectified and romanticized in very problematic ways um, Native American peoples. In my more recent work in a book called Wildness that uh, Robin generously contributed an essay to, I visited Winona LaDuke on the White Earth Reservation in Minnesota and, and thinking through uh, Catlin's inability to really co-produce knowledge with the peoples he visited with, and tried to just listen when I was there. And a gentleman named Michael Dahl asked me a question that Robin and I are now writing on for a new book called What Kind of Ancestor Do You Want to Be? And that's the question that uh, one of Winona's elders asked me to think about, and I just listened to him. And since, Regina, you brought up language, and Rob, you brought up language. I thought I would read how Michael speaks about one word in their language. Um, maybe to get us thinking about the power of understanding a place 
um, from the perspective of indigenous language. And this is what Michael had to say to me. For him, the question of what kind of ancestor do you want to be had to do with um, whether or not there was wild rice for his great, great, great grandchildren uh, on White Earth Reservation. And that meant there not being acid rain, and it meant there not being extreme climate change, that meant the rice not being patented by corporations. And so for him, the answer for how, what kind of ancestor is he now, is not how will his descendants talk about him when they see his crumbling photograph on the wall. It wasn't about him. It was an answer that would come from the land. Right? Would there be interaction with wild rice? Um, so excuse me while I find the page. Here's what he said. I'm going racing. There's so many different pictures we get in our mind when we say it in English. But instinctively, when I hear Manu Minike, I picture a lake, I picture a canoe, I picture a pole, I picture knockers, I picture the hide that lays in the bottom of the canoe when you riced about 50 pounds in the canoe. It looks almost like a moose hide. I hear the sounds of rice, I hear the squeak on the side of the canoe, I hear the trickle of the rice hitting the canoe, I hear the popping of it when it's parching, I hear the popping of the fire, I smell the fire, I taste the rice, all encompassed in one word, manuminike. I want my four-year-old son to grow up and not take for granted that not everybody gets to greet their dad when they come off the lake. Not everybody gets to lay on the garage floor and open a piece of green rice off a tarp and eat it. Not everybody gets to parch rice and eat freshly popped rice. Not everybody gets to do that. I don't want my son to take that for granted. And so for him, this massive question of what kind of ancestry he wanted to be comes down to one word. But that one word is a portal to do a multi, multi, multi-generational relationship between people and place and livelihood and labor and rice. And I'm just curious uh, for each of you, uh, Robin, Regina, when you think about the question, what kind of ancestor do you want to be you know, what's, what's your rice? Uh, is there a word, like with Michael, that sort of captures that and sparks you and spurs you toward action? That's funny, because I've encountered that same uh, statement and question in a few other gatherings and events. You know, what kind of ancestor do you want to be? And it's a, it was really interesting, because it took me for surprise the first time. I was like, oh, geez. Well, I was still classifying myself as someone of the younger generation, so I always thought I'm a youth. And then the other day, my daughter says, Mom, do you realize you're getting close to 50? I'm like, oh, crap, there's another group that I've got to think about. But one of the things that really, really has inspired me, and, and I've, I've encountered this not only in my own tribal community, in my, my own corner of the world, so to say, even with the, the non-Indians and the, the, the Indians as well. But one of the things that I've encountered is how exhausted we've made ourselves trying to answer questions like that. And one thing that my grandmother reminded me of when I was in the midst and in the middle of, of going back and forth to D.C., being in, in Denver, being in Salt Lake, was how tired I had gotten. And she says, remember what we do. And I was like, what do you mean, we? She said, you know, our elders and ancestors, they always took a moment to sit still, be quiet, and rest. So what kind of an ancestor do I want to be? I want to be a peaceful ancestor. I want to be the one that reminds my children, my grandchildren, and those yet to come, that. Every cause is a good cause. Every piece of knowledge is great to be reminding of us that sometimes we do need to just sit still, be quiet, step back for a moment and be peaceful. Because the next moment you're, you're going to be finding yourself engulfed in these very, very important issues of what do we do with water? What are we going to do with the land when 
We can't get anything else from it except for the waste. That's going to be exhausting enough. So before we get to those points, become peaceful. Find that as your resource. Find that as your solution. Find that in that moment. And that's the type. That's what I want to, I want to impress upon everybody is, is finding that, that peacefulness and restfulness that when you do have to lead into those charges and into those fights, that remember what that moment was like. And I think there's enough evidence out there that says that our people did take time to grow those plants, to talk to those plants, to find that sense of peace and create that space of sitting still, being quiet, and listening to one's heart. Robin? That's beautiful, thank you. When, in response to your question, John, I went to one of my elders to inquire about this question of what kind of ancestor do I want to be? And so I went to an ancient one, and this is an ancient sugar maple. I really do regard the plants as my teachers. And so this grandmother sugar maple who has seen so much change over the world, I went and talked to her on this matter of what does it mean to be a good ancestor and what her teachings were for me on this. And Spending time with her, the answer that that she shared and that, that seems so true for me is that for me to be a good ancestor, I want to be a student of soil. Because what that grandmother sugar maple said to me was build good soil. Good ancestors build good soil. And I take that to me to build capacity for creativity and life in the future. I can't see far into the future to know what my what my great grandchildren will face, what the world will be like. But I do know that it is soil that enables life to work, to renew itself in whatever form is right for the time and the and the circumstance. And so I ask myself, how do you build good soil? How do you create that potential for growth and and renewal and becoming? Soil to me is, is a repository of both memory, because soil is made of the life that came before, but it is also the source of the life yet to come. So how do we link that, that which our ancestors have given us, the memory, um, with the potential for the future? And the way I think of answering that question, how does a human person represent good soil, good soil building for resilience for, for the future is through story, through to maintain our stories and our teachings so that those stories which guided people in the past can once can be new again, these are these are timeless stories that are that are meant to guide us in the future. So to be a good repository of memory, but also to create the conditions for new solutions to arise. And um, so as a scientist, as a, as a teacher, as a student of plants, um, that's, that's my conception of how to be, what it means to be a good ancestor, is to build good soil so that life in the future can flourish. Not to dictate what that life will be, um, but to create a possibility for fertility and flourishing into the future. Thank you, Robin. It's beautiful. And you know, given what you were talking, given what you're saying about kinship and about challenging how we view the world as things and stuff, soil would therefore have to be seen as an ancestor. Yeah. I'll take about 12 years to wrap my brain around that one. Um, and you know what you both made me think about, though, is you know, you, you mentioned that it's a, it's a it's a heavy question and it's one that one has fatigue about to think about answering. Building good soil is a form of, of responsibility and, and work. Um, it, it's, it reminded me of, of a great author, uh, I think a mutual friend, a woman named Julianne Warren, 
And I was at an event with her a couple weeks ago, and uh, she's done great work for the Center for Humans and Nature. I recommend many of you, because they get at the intersection of science and art as well, and story, uh, humansandnature.org. They just have so much incredible stuff there. But one of the things she said in this event was, we have a right to our responsibilities. Right? And sometimes we feel the weight of our responsibilities, the stress of our responsibilities. But she gave it a really interesting spin. Like it's almost a, a gift that we must fight for to have responsibilities. And I'm curious in the way you're talking about soil and your work in bears ears, what does that phrase mean when we have a right to our responsibilities? Interesting question. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's so much along the way that as a child that I, I was taught by my parents and my grandparents. And one of the, the things as a, as a youth woman, when you're, when you're first brought into this world, you're brought in with prayer. Parents say, grandparents say a prayer. They lay that prayer down out on the land. There's, there's a certain protocol that's followed by your family, that gets done for you. At some point, that responsibility becomes yours. So as, as I became a young lady, I acquired certain roles and responsibilities. As I became a mother and a grandmother, now I become that, as, as Robin has mentioned, I become that soil that has to provide that memory as well as, well as information. And so those rights and responsibilities, so they're, they're not necessarily taught. You're born with those by a division of, of, of your, your, your identity as a male or a female. You automatically know those. As a mother, you're, you're closely looked at as being someone similar as to our Mother Earth. You're, you're a provider, you're a caretaker, you're a nurturer. And so you're just naturally born into these things. And as you're moving along, you're learning about what your roles and responsibilities are. Um, and then moving into the community, you, and as you, like I was brave enough to become an elected official, and um, that role became greater, but it felt more like a burden, which sometimes was overwhelming, but I, I had to step back, and, and it's it's because of my ability to go back to my grandmothers. And so many of you, if you follow me, I speak of my grandmothers, because that's where my source of of information was at, was, and, and the energy and the encouragement. They were fulfilling their role, I was fulfilling mine. And so part of that is, is it's just something that naturally happens. Sometimes we don't understand that it, it's not something taught, it's something that's just there. Um, it's, it took me a long time to figure that one out. Because I think a lot of times we think you get it assigned, like the teacher goes into the classroom and says, this is your assignment, not what bill, what you need to do to, to acquire a grade. And sometimes it really isn't, it's something that's in your heart. Something that you experience out when you're alone or with other people. It's it's. It's a sense of awakening, um, and to find that, and, and be able to step up to that and fulfill that role and responsibility, um, or you may even identify it during conducting your daily duties. There's just a sense of awakening that many of us aren't aware of. People want to eat. Robin, I'd like to give you the chance to respond to John's question, but I need to make one quick announcement to the audience here. Um, sure. So we are uh, running a tiny bit behind on our schedule today. I just want to let you know that our next presenter, Brianne Cohen, who's going to be here, um, I feel like we've got a little flexibility to wrap up our conversation here. I don't want to rush that, but I do want to just remind everybody that the next talk is a choice. So if you'd like to see Eugenia Bohm speaking on insights of the unseen world, speaking about soil building and microbiology and the role of richness in our molecular world, um, she'll be across the street at the Blue Sage starting very, very soon. So if you want to see that talk, 
please head over there. Um, we're going to um, dovetail this conversation here shortly. Brianne Cohen will be coming up. And I just want to let you know, too, that our lunchtime will take place at Town Hall starting at 12.35 until 1.30. Um, that's just across the street and a couple doors down. So if you have questions about where to get that, that starts at 1230. Um, but I, I don't I don't want to rush this conversation too much. I want to get Brianna up on the stage, but just for folks that are trying to get across the street, just to remind you about that part of the program. Thanks. Okay. Um, yes, Robin, if you would now respond to John Mark. No problem. Give me a minute to think. <laughs> First of all, I, I, I love... Go ahead. No, you don't go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, First to say that I love that question and the grace of your response, of what are our responsibilities. The question itself, having the rights to our responsibilities, reminds me of a wonderful teacher, the late uh, Chief Irving Powell at Onondaga Nation, who when he talks about how the uh, United States government modeled its constitution and its form of governance after the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, he, he will tell all about that history and then shake his head to say that they got one thing wrong. And that is, they wrote a bill of rights when they should have written a bill of responsibilities. And and I love that that teaching. Um, for me, that question of exercising the right to your responsibility, to me, comes um, so clearly in things like land care. Um, that I feel like in in reciprocity for the gifts of the land, my responsibility is to care for that land and to protect that land and to defend that land. And so when Julianne talks about the right to your responsibilities, um, that opens a whole door, I think, to things like traditional land care practices and indigenous knowledge for caring for land. For example, as Potawatomi people of the fire, um, you know, when it is our responsibility to care for the land, using beneficial fire to care for the land, but our rights to care for the land using that, that sophisticated tool were abridged by force versus policies of fire suppression, for example. So that's just one tiny example of, of how abridging rights to our responsibilities is written on the land and has consequences on, on the landscape. There was uh, room in the schedule for Q&A with Robin, but I am the boss, so I'm going to have to cut this off right now. So um, please give a hand for Robin and for Thank you. Thank you. It was good to be with you all. Enjoy the rest of your time together.